Well, uh, good morning to the latest of the uh, Energy Exchange Series. Um, very, very grateful that our guest, um, Mr. Paul Simon from the IEA, um, has found some time in his very busy schedule. So we're on a little bit of a timeline this morning. Um, as you know, we've had the IEA have here before with, with Fadji Bula, who was up a couple of years ago. You know they're widely recognised as a global authority on, web, on the data-driven forecasting for energy use for energy, energy technology transformations, which you'll hear a little bit about today. We know we've just had a federal election, which gave some people a bit of a shock and some people not a bit of a shock. So we're not here to do anything on the partisan side. The only thing we're trying to do here is promote debate, discussion and dialogue. So we are absolutely not along the lines of the politics in this space. Our intention is only to create a broad, a broad uh, really a broad church for discussing energy and transformations as we go forward. We also know that there's a massive need for trusted and acceptable information for the public. And some of you may have seen some work by Professor Peter Ashton, who's sponsored by NERA, which showed the importance of energy literacy uh, to the population, and energy literacy in particular in Australia, to accepting uh, the way the route and pathway to long-term transformation. So if you haven't seen that before, I recommend it greatly. Of course, at UQ we have a great amount of research um, in the energy space. Um, it's a very broad church, it's across technical, engineering, political, and social matters. I'll give you a few examples. We have a, a rapid switch project led by Professor Chris Gregg, who's, who's usually standing here, but he's in Princeton at the moment. That's a collaboration between Princeton, um, Tsinghua University, Indian Institute of Technology, and others. Um, and he's really looking there at what's the constraints on the rate of change, or the rate of pace, what are the social and political bottlenecks, what are the, what are the supply chain bottlenecks, and so on. Because um, it's increasingly, as we increasingly don't want to significantly improve the gross material emissions, the case for urgency and the required pace of employment becomes higher and higher, and it's the pace that he's particularly looking at. We're also looking, as you probably know, at a significant amount of research in the natural gas space. Uh, that's, that's my group. Um, we're looking at natural gas as a transition transition to a decade-long transition fuel, but we've also got, I'll just leave them off, low CO2 hydrogen, solar biotechnology, which is a group of 30 international teams. We've got a significant amount of work on batteries, particularly flexible screen printed batteries, um, which is looking at things like medical devices and wearable electronics. We're doing that with UNSW, and it's being supported by um, energy innovator and philanthropist uh, Travis and Baker. Trevor and Judith and Baker Family Foundation have also given um, an endowment here for UQ to establish a visiting fellowship, and that's going to bring in world leading um, academics to the university. And they're going to be looking particularly in that group uh, along the e mobility stage. So I think you'll hear a little bit this morning about the stickiness of moving out of oil based things for, trans for transportation. So we'll see there's some movement in the energy generation sector, but very little movement in the transport sector. And in addition, you'll see, you've probably seen in the press, that UQ is doing its own experimenting on the realities of transition, <coughs> and in particular, the implementation of large scale solar. And I think last month we announced uh, the start of construction of a very large solar farm down at Warwick, so the UQ Warwick Solar Farm. And when's completely ambition there is for UQ um, to entirely offset our energy against renewables. So we'll be the first of major global universities that have done that when that comes off, and that's going to be a set both for university research and education, but also in terms of helping society with the lessons learned along that space. So with that, the only thing I'm going to say in terms of context for Australia, um, and I won't show a slide about it, but we currently have a large amount of fossil fuel power. We've got gas and coal sitting there. And if you just map the natural retirement dates for that fossil fuel, by 2060, they're all retired. All else being equal. And in that time, our emissions go down to, if nothing else happens, our emissions will go down to approximately what a trajectory of Paris reductions would be. So Paris reductions go to about 2031. If you carry on the trajectory to around about 2050, 2060, if we re remove all our fossil fuel plants and do nothing else, we've met the trajectory, but of course there's a little bit of a problem that's not been replaced by anything. So that's going to happen anyway. That's already, we've already seen the first big hit with Hazelwood years ago, 
Well, you'll see the Dell and you'll see other ones coming on the boil, and you'll see our emissions profile going down, but you'll also see significant issues with energy stability and probably with energy prices too. So we're facing that now. It's beginning to happen in Amsterdam. It quits a little later, mid-2020, mid since the first week of time. But it's starting to happen in New South Wales very soon, and that starts to happen on the face. So all else being equal, we could make our emissions targets and extended Paris targets if we just retire things. Uh, but then the lights don't stay on. So that's our own particular challenge. <coughs> so without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Paul Simons. Um, so Paul Simons is the Deputy Executive Director of the IEA and he's responsible for leading the, global, the agency's global engagement strategy. He's also been in charge of the new association initiative which brought in some of the major emerging economies. The IEA was traditionally an OECD outfit. Now they've got the emerging economies of China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, into the IEA family. Paul's a former US ambassador to Chile. He strengthened the energy sector cooperation with Chile and he reactivated the Chile and California partnership. He was previously also the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Energy and Sanctions and he led the US Energy Diplomacy Initiatives uh, worldwide for four years, serving as a de in that period as delegate to the IEA Governing Board and the chair of the IEA Standing Group on Long Term Cooperation. He's held a number of other season senior management positions at the U.S. Department of State, extending from Middle East policy, Arab-Israeli negotiations, multilateral diplomacy, narcotics, law enforcement, and so on. He's going to speak to us today on, broadly speaking, on energy um, transitions with a technology perspective, I believe. Um, so with that, no uh, further ado, I'm going to welcome uh, Paul Simon. And, uh, I'm going to frame my discussion today largely around uh, carbon emissions and, and the 
Paris Agreement. And for about three years, uh, we saw what looked like uh, a leveling off of global uh, carbon uh, emissions, uh, 2014 and 2016. It appeared uh, that the world had been successful in decoupling its uh, energy growth from its uh, CO2 growth. But in the last two years, uh, that has changed. And uh, we've had fairly substantial uh, increases in, in emissions uh, that have uh, accompanied higher levels of economic growth and higher levels of, of uh, energy growth. So we still really have to cope with uh, this emissions uh, situation. The IDA puts together uh, long-term scenarios out to 2040, taking a look at global energy, taking a look at global emissions. And our, uh, what we call the new policy scenario, which uh, basically tracks what countries agree to do now in terms of their Paris commitments, their nationally determined contributions, shows uh, no, uh, <clears throat> no peaking anytime soon in global emissions. Uh, however, in order to get onto the Paris uh, uh, targets, uh, we would need to uh, do a couple things. We need to peak emissions very, very soon in the next uh, couple of years, and then we need to go on a very uh, strong uh, downward path, uh, basically to half uh, uh, global emissions by 2040. And the IEA sets this out in our uh, world energy outlook as what we call the sustainable development scenario. So uh, this basically tracks the UN SDG sustainable development goals, uh, not only the goal for climate, but also the goal of ensuring uh, energy access uh, by 2030 to uh, all the world's uh, population, what's called SDG number seven. And in terms of the technologies that would require to uh, get onto this path, uh, for many years we've argued that energy efficiency is uh, the most important uh, element in the equation would uh, take care of about almost 40% of that gap. Uh, renewables also uh, would need to uh, be boosted much uh, more quickly than the current path. But also, uh, in addition to efficiency in renewables, uh, we would need uh, further progress, uh, a fairly dramatic expansion of nuclear power, uh, dramatic expansion of carbon capture uh, and other fuel switching. Uh, and, and, and none of this really uh, is uh, on track. Uh, efficiency in particular, uh, we need to get to about a 3% annual uh, improvement in uh, energy efficiency to get onto this track. And we're, uh, we've been below 3% uh, for the past couple of years. The 2018 uh, was a particularly weak year on uh, energy uh, efficiency. We're not seeing uh, countries uh, pick up uh, in terms of adopting more uh, mandatory efficiency standards and public support uh, for uh, efficiency uh, is pretty low, uh, particularly in the transport sector. So this is uh, definitely an area, uh, and the IEA is doing a tremendous amount of work, a tremendous amount of research in this area, particularly on the uh, issue of cooling. We have talked about this at the table before, uh, but the challenges in countries like China and India uh, as they ramp into the middle class uh, energy efficient cooling is going to be uh, essential. Uh, we also noted uh, last year uh, for the first time that uh, renewables uh, leveled off a bit in terms of capacity additions and this is this is problematic uh, because if you take a look at the where would we need to get in terms of Paris we need to be up at around uh, 300 uh, gigawatts per year of renewable capacity and we're only mm, about half that level. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in the future, but definitely this is, this is a, an area that needs uh, uh, more uh, attention uh, to reduce uh, risk in particular. So uh, that's a little bit of uh, a background uh, to frame uh, the work that we do in tracking uh, clean energies. And essentially for about the past 10 years, uh, in connection with the clean energy ministerial process. The IEA has taken a look at about 40 <coughs> different technologies and has analyzed them on an annual basis to see uh, which technologies are on track to, to essentially create that downward emissions path that would get us to the uh, Paris uh, targets. And so we have a, a kind of a green, yellow, red, 
stoplight system. And uh, so what I'm going to do today is kind of update you on where we are with the latest in 2018. And uh, the big picture message uh, is that uh, we only have seven technologies out of the 45 uh, that we track, uh, which are actually uh, on track, uh, that, are, that are moving uh, pretty well. And uh, I'm not going to get into huge detail because I don't have time uh, to talk about where we are with each of these technologies, um, but we have updated our website now, and uh, it's interactive. If you go on the IEA website, you can take a look at each of these uh, individual technologies and take a look at graphs uh, that show you uh, where we got up to now, what the forecast is for the next five years, and what we would need, uh, where we would need to be uh, to get on track uh, for the Paris Agreement out to 2040. I'm going to talk about a few of the technologies, uh, but I, I don't have time to go uh, into uh, every one. Uh, the technologies that are kind of in the medium category uh, include a lot of the other uh, renewable technologies other than uh, solar, uh, biofuels, uh, aviation uh, as well. And then there are quite a few technologies that really need tremendous amount more work. And here I would note in particular, probably among the most important uh, carbon capture uh, and storage technologies, uh, which uh, from our perspective are absolutely uh, essential to uh, mitigate uh, the emissions that come from uh, coal-fired uh, power generation, especially in the developing world. And the IEA uh, numbers suggest that uh, a number of countries uh, in Asia, in developing Asia in particular, uh, will continue to rely on coal uh, into the future. Uh, we don't see China, uh, we see China's uh, coal use in power generation uh, staying fairly steady, uh, going down a bit. Uh, but we see other countries uh, like India, Indonesia, others in Southeast Asia still increasing uh, their reliance on coal. And in order to uh, mitigate the emissions from coal, we need uh, a lot more attention devoted to carbon capture and storage. So the IEA has been leading uh, this effort uh, worldwide, uh, and, uh, but it's, and it's one in which Australia also has been uh, heavily uh, engaged. So I'll go and I'll say a few words about some of the uh, specific uh, technologies and what we're doing. Uh, renewables in particular, it's an interesting story uh, because uh, uh, if you take a look at the individual sub-technologies within renewables, uh, solar PV is really the only one uh, that is on track uh, in total and uh, the others are falling uh, quite a bit uh, behind. <coughs> So, uh, according to our calculations, you'd need about 7% annual growth in renewables from now out to 2030 to meet our sustainable development uh, level. And uh, this would require faster deployment of all renewable technologies, uh, including uh, hydropower. However, uh, up to now, solar PV is the only one really that uh, has uh, been on track. Uh, taking a look at uh, solar PV in particular, uh, generation increased by 31% in uh, 2018, which was quite uh, remarkable. And despite recent policy changes and uncertainties in countries like China, India, and the United States, we still see solar PV competitiveness improving tremendously. And uh, we actually see uh, solar PV uh, in terms of uh, least cost of energy calculations uh, becoming uh, less expensive uh, than coal uh, in developing Asia uh, in the next 10 to 15 years. So uh, we do see uh, a tremendous momentum uh, in terms of solar PV uh, all around the world. Uh, some government support, but less support being uh, required uh, as, uh, as we move forward. So in general, we're quite bullish on, on this technology. On the other hand, we've seen some uh, stalling uh, in terms of onshore wind, which is uh, a bit uh, troubling, uh, because uh, for a, a period of time, onshore wind was moving ahead uh, quickly. But uh, capacity only grew by about 7% this past year, and uh, we would need annual uh, contributions much uh, higher than this to get back on track 
for uh, 2030. Uh, and I think it's interesting to kind of take a look at region by region, what happened with onshore wind, why did it slow down a bit? So, uh, China did slightly better uh, this past year. Uh, their capacity increased from about 14 to 19 uh, gigawatts uh, as the government lifted some uh, development bans uh, in regions in response to relaxing some curtailment levels. So, the Chinese situation However, Europe, which had been really the engine for growth uh, of onshore wind, uh, growth uh, declined by about 20% uh, this past year. There was slower growth in Germany uh, and the UK. Uh, a lot of policy transition, auction uh, design issues, uh, some support was, uh, was uh, pulled back, and, and this caused a real stall uh, in, uh, in wind in Europe, which is troubling. Uh, in the U.S., we had uh, some uh, rebound, but again, lower than expected. Uh, uncertainties concerning corporate tax and concerning uh, policies. India also slowed down uh, this uh, past year uh, fairly substantially. So, uh, onshore wind, we think, uh, definitely uh, needs a, a boost. Offshore wind uh, also uh, is promising, uh, but we only saw a generation increase by about 20% this past year from a very uh, low base. Uh, we really need a lot more progress on offshore wind to get on track for our 2030 uh, goals. Uh, it's interesting, offshore wind, a lot of the momentum shifted. It had been a European phenomenon for many years. The momentum shifted uh, to China uh, this past year. Uh, installations more than tripled in China. China became uh, the number one growth area for uh, offshore wind. Uh, but again, the magnitude of the required increases for these technologies are huge. We need a fourfold increase by 2030 in offshore wind. And uh, growth then really would uh, need to accelerate quite a bit. We've seen some promising indications that costs are coming down in offshore wind uh, as much as 45 to 50% in the next uh, few years. Uh, the capacities are increasing tremendously, the largest. Uh, now, uh, turbines are up to around 12 uh, megawatts uh, each, uh, and these are helping uh, lower uh, the required uh, amounts of government support. Uh, we've also seen uh, new growth markets, the US, uh, Taipei, uh, Japan, and we see some state level initiatives in the US pushing this forward uh, as well. But again, uh, the, si the size of the required increase is quite, uh, quite large. Hydropower, uh, again, needs to move uh, quicker. Uh, it has uh, largely stalled around the world for uh, many reasons, uh, largely uh, environmental uh, related. Uh, needs also a boost. Uh, Bioenergy power generation has been uh, a success story. Uh, it's quite interesting, uh, the amount of power that's now being generated uh, through uh, waste, biomass, uh, and waste fuel uh, generation. There's a tremendous amount of creativity in China right now on, on uh, bioenergy, on electricity from bioenergy. Uh, energy from waste uh, is growing, uh, and, and China is promoting the use of agricultural residues uh, for uh, bioenergy. Uh, uh, they provided some governmental support, some feed and tariff uh, support. Brazil also, so has been a huge leader in bioenergy, uh, has a new scheme in place, a very creative scheme. Uh, to promote additional transport biofuels. It's a CO2-related uh, uh, initiative, and we're expecting that that's also going to create more demand uh, for bio-based uh, bio uh, electricity uh, generation. So this is, this is an interesting uh, area. The idea is done a lot of research in, in uh, bioenergy. It was the focus of our 2018 uh, renewables report. We're actually seeing uh, bioenergy being the, the single uh, largest contributor uh, actually to, uh, to total uh, energy production among uh, all of the renewable uh, energy space. A couple of the other technologies we focus on, I'm not going to go into great detail, but again, they move much slower than expected. Some people have suggested the IEA has been a bit pessimistic in the past on certain technologies, but for example, concentrated solar power, uh, which has uh, the ability to deliver 24-7 uh, solar uh, has moved very, very slowly. We haven't seen the cost declines expected, and it's definitely not on track uh, at all. Geothermal also, uh, which is a very interesting technology, has a lot of promise. 
The IDA has done a lot of research into geothermal, but we have not seen uh, the increases required. Ocean generation, also a very interesting technology. Uh, it's being uh, worked on in Canada, it's being worked on in the UK, Scotland. But again, uh, costs have not come down uh, significantly, and uh, the amount of required growth is very, very large. So uh, these, these are sort of within the renewable space, uh, how we're doing with the different components of technology. I wanted to talk about a couple of other, uh, very briefly, a couple of other uh, technology uh, areas that are the focus of our uh, report and, and of some of our work. Uh, one of them is RAM. Uh, the IEA recently uh, completed an interesting study on the future of rail, and uh, we rolled this out in India, uh, which is a country that could benefit uh, tremendously from the expansion of rail. And rail is one of the most efficient and lowest emitting uh, transport modes. It carries about 8% of the world's uh, motorized passenger movements, about 7% uh, of freight, but it only accounts for 2% of energy uh, use. So uh, there's tremendous opportunity for rail uh, to reduce uh, oil uh, consumption uh, in the future uh, and emissions, both in terms of urban uh, as well as in terms of freight. And uh, again, rail has to expand a, a lot more quickly uh, to get on track uh, for any of our Paris uh, compliant scenarios. But uh, it does hold a tremendous uh, promise. Uh, you can see from the chart here that in terms of uh, efficiency, uh, it's by far uh, the most efficient way uh, to move people around, especially motorized uh, transit. It's pretty impressive to see what's going on actually here in Brisbane. Uh, with the expansion of rail, I think it's, uh, uh, it's exciting to see uh, uh, these uh, urban uh, infrastructure projects uh, move ahead. Uh, and uh, the IEA in our study, we took a look at the various air, uh, railway services uh, and infrastructure. We analyzed passenger, we analyzed the freight, uh, urban as well as uh, long term. And uh, we took a look also at costs and where they might be going uh, in the future. And in particular, we took a look at China. Uh, and the reason that we bumped up rail to being on track uh, with our Paris commitment is largely because of the expansion of high-speed rail uh, in China. But even though rail is moving ahead in China, you can see from the chart, domestic aviation is also expanding tremendously in China. So, uh, you know, we're chasing after a moving target here, uh, but it is it is impressive to see uh, this type of expansion, and of course, uh, much will also depend. Uh, and the IEA analysis into both electric vehicles and rail focuses on this. If you shift it to electrification, uh, you also have to make sure that the uh, the basis, the, the CO two basis of your electricity system, is also uh, decarbonizing. So, I mean, this is an issue for China, it's also an issue for India. If you push more onto the rail, but you still have a coal-dominated electricity system, uh, then you're not necessarily going to get the CO2 uh, benefits uh, that could be expected. So, the IEA has uh, been focusing also on its analysis uh, in ensuring uh, that any shift to rail or any shift to electric vehicles is also accompanied by a decarbonization of the electricity system. And you can also see some of the charts, uh, again, these are all available online, uh, that suggest that uh, rail has some disadvantages too, it has very, very high capital costs. Uh, but at the same time, uh, costs per throughput capacity uh, are definitely uh, a benefit. So uh, the, the final theme uh, that I wanted to touch on a little bit this morning is uh, the oil and gas sector itself, what it can do to reduce some of its own uh, internal emissions. And the numbers, uh, we tracked this for the first time this year in our uh, tracking clean energy progress. We added a couple of other categories. Uh, we added a flaring and we added uh, methane. Uh, because in our dialogue with the industry, uh, the IEA is spending uh, quite a bit of time focusing on actually uh, the emissions that come from uh, the energy sector itself. And uh, they're actually pretty high. Uh, about 15% of total uh, global uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from the oil uh, and gas uh, 
sector itself, a lot in the refining area, but also in the uh, uh, oil and gas uh, extraction. And uh, methane leaks uh, and flaring are responsible for about half of these. The other half is the extraction process and uh, refining. And so we've been uh, working with uh, many companies uh, in this uh, area. Uh, a lot of the companies are involved in something called the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, OGCI, uh, which aims to improve methane data collection uh, and develop cost-effective methane management uh, technologies. There are 13 major uh, oil and gas companies uh, involved uh, in this. Uh, we also have the Oil and Gas Methane Partnership, uh, providing protocols for companies to survey and address uh, emissions. Uh, but we also note that in addition to voluntary efforts by the private sector, uh, governments also uh, can, can give a, a push. Policies and regulations are essential uh, to bring emissions more uh, into line with our sustainable development scenario. And you can see here that these methane emissions have been pretty stubbornly high over the past uh, 15 or 20 years, and they need uh, a real step change uh, in ambition uh, to uh, bring them down. So we've been working also with countries, with uh, member countries, uh, on, this, uh, on this effort. And uh, flaring as well, flaring uh, has been pretty high, it's coming down a bit, uh, but it would need, uh, according to our computations, again, to take a step change down in order to get back on track uh, in terms of the Paris commitments. So uh, this concludes my remarks uh, for today. I've given you a little bit of a, a broad picture of, of some of the technology spaces that we're operating in, some of the level of ambition, huge level of ambition that's needed to get back on track with uh, Paris. Again, one of our big messages is there's, there is a disconnect disconnect between the world's climate uh, ambitions and sort of what's happening on the ground. You can see that in terms of the big gaps in virtually every technology between what the trades have been and what you need to get to 2030, uh, 2040. Uh, we have only identified seven technologies on track. Again, you can go in more detail in our website uh, on there, but we need to move much uh, quicker here. Governments clearly uh, have a role to play. Uh, government drives a lot of movement, especially uh, in energy efficiency. The market needs help, but the private sector also clearly has a role to play, as do uh, universities. Uh, research uh, that's underway here is it's very innovative. Uh, the IEA has always taken a look at all technologies, a broad mixture of innovative technologies, energy storage I didn't have time to mention, carbon capture, methane, Hydrogen, which we're working on with the chief scientists, they all need to work together. R&D efforts uh, need to be uh, supported as well. And we do continue to work on all fuels uh, and technologies. We have 38 technology cooperation programs that involve uh, the private sector and researchers to take a look at these individual technologies. But we do need uh, further progress uh, in all of them. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions.
take a look at the United States and the recent tax credit that's been put into place for uh, carbon capture and storage projects, 35 to $50 a ton. You're seeing you're getting into some of that uh, sweet spot. So we do expect that with, uh, it will be difficult to do without any carbon price at all. But with carbon prices moving into the direction that we see them in the United States now, as well as in Europe, and then there are individual countries in Europe that push the carbon price up even higher. Sweden, for example, has a carbon price above $100 per ton. And there's a tremendous amount of interest now uh, in the industrial sector in uh, carbon capture uh, and storage uh, for industry. Uh, so uh, I, I think the answer is yes. Uh, but the amount of, uh, the number of demonstration projects uh, is, continues to be very low. So uh, even though the costs seem to be coming down, we think the cost decline could be accelerated substantially if there were more uh, demonstration projects uh, underway. And, uh, but I think the other point is the private sector. The oil and gas industry has got a lot more in. It's become a lot more interested in this technology uh, in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, the IEA sponsored uh, a big conference last year in Edinburgh, and we had CEOs from a lot of the top uh, oil and gas uh, upstream companies. So uh, I think the industry is, is getting extremely uh, interested in this, and, uh, but it's something that it will continue to need a push. Any more from the floor? There's a gentleman here, and then there's a gentleman there with the beard, and then there's this one down here. Uh, hello, the 8.9 overview of a lot of the energy production technologies. What's your view on certain things like energy conservation, for example?
efficiency. So uh, definitely needs a push, but the consumer also uh, needs to uh, come on board. Uh, and um, it's going to be a particular challenge in developing countries. Companies like India, uh, we've been able to show that if India builds in from the start much higher efficiency standards, especially for things like air conditioning, uh, they'll need to f build uh, fewer uh, coal plants uh, in the future. Uh, and just the total size of the infrastructure investment that they'll need could go down a bit. But you're right, we, you, you gotta get the consumer uh, on, on track. And also, if we, we do a lot of work you know, with energy efficiency training with governments and, uh, around the world, uh, as well as the private sector. And the energy efficiency community is very diverse and dispersed. It's not located in one ministry or in one uh, industry association, so it's it's kind of hard to get your handles around this. So what we've done is we've created, tried to create communities of practice in different sub-specialties within efficiency. So we have a buildings group, we've got an appliance group, but they're all completely different people. They don't talk to each other, they don't work on the same issues. So it's, it's a big challenge. The number of people that you have to have involved in energy efficiency, say compared with like this methane, it's a, it's, a, it's a wicked problem, but it's very clearly defined. Uh, the efficiency is not. It's, uh, you, you have a lot more actors, and uh, it, it, it's just a, a more complex problem. Thank you. We have someone on the table, this is General Davian.
unfortunately, I think everyone's got a different story. Um, because as we go year to year, the green lights change a lot. So, uh, solar PV, I think, has benefited from a huge amount of governmental support over the past decade. I mean, the feed-in tariffs got drove solar, they drove the costs down, they drove the mastication of the industry. Uh, it, it, so, uh, but we haven't seen necessarily that level of political support for something like carbon capture and storage. If we had had the same amount of government support for carbon capture and storage that we had for solar PV, we'd be in a totally different situation today. So, uh, so sometimes, and so you need more research R &D, and sometimes you need some governmental support, policy support uh, in the uh, early uh, phases uh, is important. About 10 of those technologies are energy efficiency. And again, there too, uh, sometimes uh, we have a customer, consumer behavior, uh, and we have just the price, the market, the market clearing process. Um, there's just maybe not that much incentive uh, when global electricity prices are kind of moderate. Uh, they're on the way down. Uh, you just don't have the same uh, incentive for these, uh, for these efficiency uh, improvements. Uh, and, and again, uh, a lot depends on the R&D, what's going on in the R&D space. And uh, there too, uh, we've seen a lot of flattening of budgets. Uh, which is problematic. Actually, in our review in Australia, we saw budgets actually go down fairly substantially, R&D. I think they're back up a little bit. But one of the recommendations in our country review for Australia is that the energy R&D budgets uh, go uh, back up again. Worldwide, we have an initiative called Mission Innovation that was launched in Paris uh, Climate Talks to have the government share of energy R&D double uh, over five years, but we're not on track for that double, uh, even though the government's committed to it. So uh, definitely uh, uh, more R&D uh, is part of it, and some uh, governmental support. Another question. We've got two more questions. Thank you, Connor. Thanks for your fantastic presentation. Um, the, I'm particularly impressed with the IEA reports that, that track a number of different scenarios, three primary scenarios that are business as usual, uh, new policy, and sustainable development as well. That can kind of help us to see the differences between, between different scenarios. But the different uh, energy mix we have today is of course a result of very particular externalities in the market. That, that uh, for example, carbon being the biggest has been free from blue carbon and hence that favours a particular industry that we've seen from the results. Is there any appetite within IA to, to look at different scenarios for different types of externalities in the market. So if those, if those externalities change, for example, prices on carbon, also also cost of pollution in terms of air pollution, major issue in developed countries, other issues, uh, environmental issues with extraction, etc. Is there any, any appetite to see what it would look like if those uh, externalities were different? Well, actually, we have some of those built into the existing scenario. So the sustainable development scenario, in order to get those bumps, those declines, uh, in our estimation, you would need a carbon price of 100 to 150 dollars a ton uh, by 2040. So, without that, you need that as a driver, as a driver to to push uh, the adoption of those technologies. And I think it's it's a big question where the world is going in terms of carbon pricing and carbon taxation. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives in different countries underway uh, right now. There's a, there's a big initiative in the U.S. in, in Congress to take a look at uh, a carbon uh, a carbon tax that would be uh, rebated. Uh, the EU obviously is doing a reform of their uh, emissions trading system that appears to be on the way to bumping up uh, the carbon price uh, one way or another. Uh, China is taking a look at the carbon pricing. Chile, uh, and we have some very in, we got a lot of innovation going on, especially in Europe. Uh, countries like Sweden, who have been able to bump up their carbon price and not suffer in terms of industry impact. So I think the of experimentation, on the other hand, there's this social uh, concern about who's going to pay uh, for, uh, for the energy transition. Uh, and of course,
that's playing out uh, in many countries around the world as well. So, uh, so it's a big, it's a big question. That was about a longer question than I thought. Also, actually, just for another time, which is so busy. Thank you very much, Paul Simon. Thank you very much.